Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Kate Borges here physically to Dublin. He's giving him to tell us about decoherence and reliable date time predictions. Thank well, you. Let's start my timer here. Good. Where I can see it. it. Um, so, thank you for the chance to speak here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being in person. <laughs> thank you for not being being uh, uh, hard, to, hard to read, a room hard to read. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, two things, actually. The one thing, there's a bigger picture, and then there's a calculation, which is an illustration of the bigger picture. So the the uh, bigger picture is about um, how in cosmology and in, uh, in gravitational physics in general, uh, there's a generic difficulty in making predictions at late times uh, if you're using perturbative methods. And uh, the good news is there are lots of tools for solving that problem coming from outside of gravitational physics. And the message of the main part of the talk is we should use those tools. And so then most of the talk will be talking about one of those tools and using it to calculate a specific thing. And the specific thing will be, uh, uh, there's a very nice story in cosmology about how uh, primordial fluctuations that people see in the sky uh, have the properties that would be consistent with them having come from uh, quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And so that's a kind of a classic situation where you've got a quantum system gravitating and you're interested in, in the late time evolution of it. And one of the questions uh, that story raises is how do the initially quantum fluctuations become classical when we see them at late times? And so the calculation I'd like to describe for you is a calculation of uh, the decoherence of those primordial fluctuations. And, and the way to think about it is as, as an illustration of these broader techniques. That's the, the, main, the main theme of the talk. And so it's, I can advance the slides now. So okay. it's, yes. Before you leave the portable, I thought you were going to fit oh. it into the talk. Yes, sorry, this, is, this, was, this was my last weekend. This is the county carry, right? <laughs> and so, so it's, uh, there, there's, it's, it's, it's a very coherent place. And so there's, not, there's no, no, no real connection to the talk, but it's just, it's a beautiful place. I, I want to put that here. <laughs> I thought it might be the quantum fluctuation. In the <laughs> I should have had a pattern for that. But I didn't. <laughs> so so the, the calculation I'm going to describe is uh, done with uh, these fine people, that is Vincent Venin and Jerome Martin from Paris, Richard Holman, who uh, uh, until recently was in California. And then the one you uh, may not know is Greg Kaplanek. He's a new postdoc at uh, Imperial, and he did much of the heavy lift lifting, and so he's the guy to watch. And uh, the aspirational archive number is this month, but I, you know, here we are at the end of the month, and it's probably not going to be this month. So it's, it could be out any time, uh, but not yet. So what, what I'd like to do is, is in the first... Is, we're going to be 10 minutes in before we get to the table of contents or the, the, the outline of the talk, but I want to kind of flesh out that story I told you. So, so the, there's many questions in, in, in uh, quantum gravity, uh, things like information loss or uh, eternal inflation, which are relying on making statements of late times. And it's kind of the message of, of the, uh, one of the messages of the talk is that you can make those calculations, but it's difficult to make them because Perturbation theory always fails at late times. That's something which in particle physics, which is how I was trained, we're less familiar with that statement because in particle physics, if you're doing scattering, you've got wave packets that overlap, they separate, there are no late times. But you have something that just sits there and you interact with it you know, forever. Very, very small interactions can build up and it'll give you big changes. And that's relevant to the gravity problems because uh, almost all of people's intuitions on late time gravitational behavior are based on Calculations involving essentially free fields interacting with the gravitational uh, background, such as the Hawking radiation calculation or, or the inflationary calculations of uh, primordial fluctuations that I can say more about. And implicit in, a cal in, a, in drawing inferences from free systems interacting with gravitational fields is that if there had been interactions, they could be small enough that you could perturb them and they won't change the answer much. So anything, any situation where perturbation theory is threatened is a threat to all of your intuition for how these things are behaving if you're basing it on free systems, which essentially is what most of these uh, analyses are based on. 
And so the tool uh, that I'm going to steal completely from optics and for condensed matter physics is uh, one which is designed to solve this problem in another context. And there's good evidence now that it's actually doing a great job in the gravitational context as well. And so we're crazy not to use it in gravity. I'd like to set up the calculation because uh, everybody's not going to be cosmologists. And so so the, I'm going to be interested in the story of primordial fluctuation. So uh, that's to do with the distribution of matter in the universe and explaining why it has the properties that it has. And the, the, the thing that organizes your thinking about that in cosmology is that uh, in an expanding universe, where the scale factor of the size of the universe is A is some of the time, there's a Hubble scale, which is A dot of Ray, which is a characteristic scale in, in the universe, and it acts as a, as a damping scale. So if you look at the evolution of any field, it typically looks something like this, the momentum mode K has this kind of evolution. And you can kind of see that if the wavelengths are long, uh, or if K of Ray is long, it's, it's small compared to H, then this looks like a damp system, and that's true. So, so, so fluctuations in the field tend to freeze when they're on wavelengths that are larger than this characteristic of the Hubble scale. So that makes it difficult to explain patterns uh, if you're in a regime which is bigger than the Hubble size because everything's frozen essentially there. So we look back in the universe. We're at the top of this uh, light cone, looking back in earlier times of the year. You know, the circles that we see as we look out are farther and farther away. We all know that. Um, but these blue circles are supposed to be the, the Hubble scale, the Hubble length, and that's also growing in time. So it's smaller now, where's the path than it is in later times. And you kind of see that, that when you look back in time, you see many regions that are, that are all multiple Hubble uh, lengths across. And so it's like looking at a bank of TV sets. And uh, the thing that's striking about cosmology, you've got a bank of TV sets that you're looking at along that distance away, and there's correlations across those TV sets that's something which needs explanation. So if you look at the microwave background, this is the temperature fluctuation in the sky, and the typical size of the TV set at this time in the universe is, is something about the size of the sun or the moon. So it's a very small fraction of the sky. And so the fact that there are correlations between here and here is the thing that you'd like to explain. They're measured, those, 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 those correlations. And they're hard to uh, understand in the simplest Big Bang uh, picture because you're finding this fact that things like the freeze when they're on, on super, super level scales. Hard to have a dynamical mechanism that makes a correlation when you have uh, super level scales. And if you look into the past, you know, this is time, this is space, this is the Hubble length that Tony was growing. And then this is a typical physical scale. It, it grows like the size of the scale factor. And so the important thing about cosmology and the late time cosmology is that they don't grow at the same rate. The Hubble scale grows faster. And so the problem is that we look at a range of scales in the sky, and when you extrapolate them back, you don't have to go very far before they're above the Hubble scale, and so they're frozen. So the puzzle in standard cosmology for primordial fluctuations has always been the biggest scale that you look at, you look uh, into the past and try to explain where they came from, and you're immediately hobbled by this super Hubble physics, which is difficult to, uh, to work with. And so the way you fix that is you, um, change the extrapolation. So that extrapolation was for a radiation dominated universe. In the inflationary picture, what you do is you imagine that there was an earlier time when the Hubble scale wasn't changing by much. And if that's true, then because the scale factor uh, satisfies that its rate of change is the you know, A dot of ray is H, that means that the, these scales are growing exponentially the cartoons here to be graphs and forth. And so, so what happens is that uh, if the universe is accelerating in its expansion, uh, the rate, the relative rates of physical scales and the Hubble scale uh, changes, and so, so the physical scales are going more quickly. So you now imagine extrapolating back, and now you can have some sort of physics here that you might be able to explain what's going on. The other approach besides inflation would be uh, people argue about whether or not the accelerated expansion started from an initial expansion universe, expanding universe, or a contracting one, which would be the balance case, but it's the same kind of physics. I'm going to focus on the inflationary case. And the oxidation is that. Uh, you can ask from here on, this is this epoch where these scales that we see now became super Hubble in the past during inflation is kind of the, the time where they last, uh, we're seeing the physics that produces the correlation and then they get frozen in and we see them at later time. So this whole picture works uh, provided you have about 60 e folding between when the scales you looked at left the horizon and when inflation ends. So this, this time here is about the universe that's expanded by e to 60. And so uh, 
The thing about inflation is that you might have thought, well, now you just move the problem earlier. Now you have some sort of complicated thing you could figure out here. What was the system that gave you the correlation to be now? But it's actually worse than that because in inflation, the universe is expanding so fast that any fluctuations you had here, they just get ironed out pretty, pretty fast because the universe is expanding so quickly. And so you really would be predicting that there's no lots of fluctuations to be in here if you've got any, any inflation happening uh, before the horizon exit. And that was originally thought to be a problem, but the uh, became a feature rather than a bug because although there are no classic fluctuations, there are quantum fluctuations that hurt along here with a size set by the Hubble scale, and that's the thing that not changing. And so, and because there are no classical fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations can win even though they're small. And so then the picture that has been successful is that there's a, a pattern of quantum fluctuations here which are basically scale invariant because the Hubble scale is not changing. And so no matter when you look, the changing scale here just changes when you cross the horizon. And so if you compare the size of quantum fluctuations here and here, you're really asking how big was the Hubble scale. And if it's not changing, then it's, it hasn't changed at all. And so uh, what you predict from this is a very close to scale invariant pattern of fluctuations, which is the brief level of the scene. So, um, but they're being produced at a, at a quantum level. And so the thing that I would like to address, and that's so far the standard story, I'd like to ask, why were those quantum fluctuations possible when you see them? Because when I say that they describe well what you see, what people really do is they take a classical distribution of fields to a scaling variant spectrum, and that agrees well with what we see at late times. And then that has the same uh, spectral properties as the, as the quantum fluctuations did in the vacuum here. But there's really an issue as to how did the quantum system become a classical system? Uh, and, and should we expect to see quantum things that uh, now that we could uh, test to see if this quantum uh, generation is right? So in a nutshell, in equations, if the wave function of your field, uh, your wave function of your field was psi, and the density matrix of your field was rho, so it has an off diagonal density matrix related to the wave function in this way. Um, what people are testing now is basically the probability that you would get by squaring this wave function, the probability of finding the field configuration. And see, yeah. You're assuming a pure state? I am, and that's the standard calculation, it's some pure state, yeah. You know, you can change that, but it tends to be that the non-pure things get ironed out by inflation, and so it's the, it's the quantum fluctuations. The unusual thing is the quantum fluctuations coming from the pure vacuum are the ones that are just sitting there at a constant level. So uh, if there's an aside that I would make about uh, there's a lot of people are thinking about late time physics. Most of them are thinking about, uh, about how do you predict this probability of late times, because that's what's measured. And there's a whole story uh, called stochastic inflation that I'm going to mention here because I'm going to talk about it again later. There's a picture based on, you know, the, I told you that if you're looking at, we see these the bank of TV screens in the sky. Uh, but people, what's happening there is that uh, small fluctuations that have happened in different parts of the universe, that they become bigger than the Hubble scale, they freeze, but they have different initial conditions, so they freeze in different places. And so, an initially homogeneous configuration becomes very inhomogeneous. But it's not so useful to know what's the profile of a field in cosmology. It's better to know the statistical properties that relate the Hubble patch here to the Hubble patch here, because that's the thing that you measure right now. And so, in the 80s, there was a, a proposal that. Um, you can describe the statistics of those different Hubble patches uh, as a kind of a random walk problem. And so they set up a stochastic, uh, there's a probability, this probability satisfied an evolution equation, which was a stochastic uh, random walk kind of an evolution equation, uh, where the noise of the walk was coming from the Hubble scale. And it was kind of a, wasn't a derived thing, it was kind of a very physical uh, intuition for how things should behave. And it seems to work very well, and I'll give you the evidence of that uh, later. But that whole story and justification of that story, and there's a lot of work going on trying to justify it from here right now, is about this diagonal part, and not about the off diagonal part, which is what my story today will be about. So the question is why does this initial thing, which was not diagonal, turn into effectively this thing, which is what a classical distribution of fields would have looked like? If you had written the density matrix it's diagonal in field space. So why is it diagonal and why is it diagonal in the field space? That is the question. And before I go too far into that, you should know that there's 
the question doesn't uh, immediately impinge on observations because as long as you only look at correlations with the field, then an expectation value of any function of the field, you can write in terms of the density matrix of the trace, and it's something which only sees the diagonal part of the density matrix. So, so the predictions that people are successfully comparing to observations are not carrying what is off diagonal part of the density matrix. And there's a another story that uh, that people often tell in this context is uh, there's a sense in which the wave function of the field that people find during inflation is a very WKB like thing. And you remember the WKB wave function there is e to some big number times some function, and that is a very classical thing because if you hit that with the momentum operator, so d phi, you pull down something which is a function of phi, and so it looks like the momentum eigenvalues are functions of the position eigenvalues. Another way of saying that is that the the commutator p with phi is order one is suppressed compared to the expectation value by one over the large number of lambda in the WKB approximation. And it's when you're outside the Hubble scale and, and inflation, it turns out that the state that you're looking at is a very WKB like thing. And so there's a sense in which uh, these things are behaving very classically in this WKB sense. Um, and these are those two last things I said are, are what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the density matrix itself. Um, I'll skip here. This is a basically the 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 pitch I want to make to you is that although you don't need for the existing observations to know what the density matrix does, the theory predicts what it does. And if you're going to try and test the quantumness of the fluctuations you see in the sky now, you need to know is the density matrix diagonal or not, because the thing you're trying to test is its off diagonalness. And so you'd like to know how does the quantumness of the state the the universe is in now um, depend on the parameters of your problem. So you can kind of see how would I uh, best test the proposal that's being made if things are quantum. Sorry. Uh, yes. Just to kind of clear one test. So are you saying that there, there would be no observable effects of a, of a, of a uh, density matrix with all diagonal terms? There could be a good rule effects. They have not been measured yet. So when I, the, the observations on which I'm saying are that when people say it's a complex test, describe what we see now in terms of quantum state, none of that relies on the off diagonal part. So, right. so whatever you do with the off diagonal part, you'll never screw that up because it doesn't care about the off diagonal part. So, so the slide that you have where you talk about the expectation value of the function of the field configurations. Yeah. You, um, is there something you can write down there that would then require you to uh, use the off diagonal terms? So yes. Yeah. So, like, like correlation between two fields, configuration between two fields. The correlation with any correlation that I would then use that would not be much as well as the field. The reason you don't need the off diagonal part is that if you're looking at positions and you're never looking at momenta, then you, you never care about the off diagonal part of the matrix in position space. So, in this case, the condition of like field. And so people are spending a lot of time now trying to think about is there kind of an EPR kind of a inequality I can build using the observations of the in the sky that would protect the economists of what they're doing. Okay. And and, so, and and no one has successfully come up with an example, but you're fighting these things that I'm talking about here that the, the WKBness of the state is making everything look classical independent of what I think of the dance matrix. So people are groping towards what are the um, what characterizes the quantum mess of the state now? And how would you measure it? Okay, so there's no no example right now something to just look at and see if we don't test the right. Oh, okay. Yeah. People are trying to find something, but then no one has one. And, and your point and the reason partly is is the previous slide that the fact that you have a very WKB state makes it just difficult to find quantum effects is because all the length and all the momenta are small. But I'm gonna the punchline of my talk is going to be that uh, that was bad, but it's actually worse than that <laughs> because the, the matrix is becoming diagonal super fast. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's even smaller than you would have thought if you had thought that was the problem. But of course, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look for it. It means that you'd like to know how do those effects depend on the variables in your problem. So you can say, well, how would I change things to, to make it as large as possible? And then that's a place to look. All right. So, so here's this calculation. Here's the, here's the answer I'm going to show you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a calculation that is really just going to track things. And the modes we're looking at are the, the, the stuff we see in the sky is red band. And I'm going to, uh, and of course, if you start with the pure state 
And if you never, if you measure everything, it's always the pure state that's the farmer cat does that. But we don't measure everything. Let me measure this stuff. So I'm going to trace over all the stuff we're not looking at. We're not, we're not measuring very short wavelengths or very long wavelengths. Short ones would be the ones that matter here. And I'm going to calculate in this regime here when you're uh, I, before inflation ends, I'm going to calculate what happens to these modes that are super Hubble due to the, the ones that are shorter than that. And so these guys are going to be greater than these guys. And, and how fast it happens will depend on what the interactions are that we assume that they experience with one another. So I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to say, we'll take the only, only the interaction that we don't have to be there, the ones that general relativity says has to be there, because general relativity is behind this whole success story. And those are very weak interactions, but I'll ask, can those be clear? And you'll see that the answer will be this. I will, I will define a variable delta, which is zero if and only if your state is pure, and I'll define it more carefully later on. And it depends on the variables in the following way. So it depends on the Hubble scale during inflation divided by the point mass. So that has to be a small, there's three small parameters in the problem. That we, we're going to be expanding an eight gram plant square. There's a slow roll parameter epsilon, which is small provided to your in, during inflation. It's not small after inflation, but this has turned out to be linear in that. And then there's this, this thing, which is the ratio of the Hubble scale to the wavelength you're of interest. So this K over AH is very small as long as your wavelength is above the Hubble scale. So this is a very large number, but uh, it's being multiplied by a very small number. So, so the, the main message will be. This factor up front here can't be bigger than 10 to the minus 14 for gravity. But this factor here goes like with A cubed, and A is an exponential in time during inflation. So this goes like A to the 3 HT, and we want 60 equal to it. So HT will be 60. This can win over 10 to the minus 14 really, really, really quickly. So the upshot will be uh, that this the off diagonalness of the uh, density matrix is falling on the rock. Um, with one caveat, I'm going to tell you this answer, which is going to really apply here. And I'm going to assume, because I can't calculate it, that once it's possible here, it doesn't become form again. Uh, and that's something which is right now just an assumption, but that's the next step that I've calculated here. Um, but that's the state of the art now. So things look like they're very classical when you leave inflation. All right, so that was uh, where we're going to go. And now it'll be a lot faster getting there now that you know where we're going to go. So I will first tell you the tool. So, so, the, so the whole issue here is I want to follow the density matrix. I want to do it at late times. And so the talk divides into two parts. What's this tool for doing late times? Because I'm going to do it perturbatively if I need to have control over perturbation theory. So that's the first part of the talk. And then I'll just apply it to cosmology. And then that'll be very fast because I'll just tell you what happens. So let's start with the tools. So I say that perturbation theory fails at late times and at some level of trivial observation. It's just, it doesn't matter how small your interaction Hamiltonian is compared to your other Hamiltonian, uh, as long as t is large. So that was a t which is large enough that this is not well approximated by this. So that's that's the thing that many times perturbation theory always fails. And you know that it's not an academic thing because you know if you have the optics, any one photon interacting with any one atom, it does it very quickly. It's a very perturbative thing. But if every photon then refracts or reflects and nobody goes straight through. Perturbation theory was a terrible description of that because the perturbation theory basically nothing happens and then you change a little bit. So what happens is you hit you know 80 billion atoms and then you're you've done one thing or the other, and perturbation theory broke down for exactly this reason. But the fact that you, you know, even optics does this tells you that you didn't have to exactly solve one letter of to say something late times. There are tools that allow you to understand late times, and those are the tools that we're good at. Now that phenomenon happens in cosmology. You know, I, I told you the story about primordial fluctuations where what we see in the sky is supposed to be related to what a field is doing, quantum field is doing in, in uh, during inflation. And that's normally done uh, where the quantum field is a free field coupled with gravity. But people have done, because cosmology is very dramatic, you can actually do the calculations of first row correction. It was done quite late, but it was done. If you imagine putting a self-interaction in with a parameter lambda and ask how does it change these predictions that people are preparing to, uh, uh, what you do is you calculate the correlation functions of the field and uh, in, in a series of powers of lambda. And the thinking normally is that lambda I can make it small delay, like, I can make it correction small delay. Like. And this is what you get. You get uh, the thing that this is what people are basing their predictions on. You get some power of h, and that's something which is a, a fluctuation that's not changing as h changes. There's a factor here involving log a, which I'm going to come back to. But then the correction is here. And this is the thing that the small as you like. 
but it's the it's the long A dependence I want you to be aware of there because uh, during inflation A is an exponential in, in time. So these logs of A's are powers of time. So that's the fact that there's always a time for which the correction is not small. It's basically the reflection in cosmology of this general issue that something just sits there and you interact with it for a long time, uh, you can get big things in the end. Now, this example is an interesting one because back in 2005, and Simon Woodard did this calculation, they did a quantum filter calculation and they identified the part that's growing in time and it's a long way from part. But they went to this thing I told you about, this uh, stochastic kind of physical picture of what's going on at wait times. And they calculated what would you have expected, since you know how the probability distribution evolves in time in that picture, they compared the time evolution of expectation values in the field, uh, calculated using this, to what they got in this field theory. And they agreed, essentially, is what, what happened. They agreed to this order, and they also did a subnormal order. And so, uh, so that was the part of the evidence that uh, there's a belief that this stochastic story is telling you what happens at late times. And you can't check it at late times because you don't know how to do this calculation at late times, but they agree as a function of time uh, in early times. But this one, you know how to do it at late times because this is a diffusion equation. At late times, it goes to a time independent limit. And you can solve for what it is by setting the left hand side of the equation equal to zero. And this is what it gives you. It says, if you had a potential here, this has been V prime rather than lambda by the fourth, you would have gotten the late time limit as some function like this. Uh, and this kind of shows you where you're going. They're accumulating a small effect and you're going to get this big again. The big thing you're going to get is uh, a non Gaussianity in the, in the field distribution. If, if V had been quadratic and pi, so it's a free field, this would be Gaussian. But any interaction term is changing with the functional formulas here, even though any one mode crosses the Hubble scale in a very Gaussian way, they accumulate late time to give you a very non Gaussian answer. So the evidence is that that's the right behavior at late times, but you could never calculate that without going through this stochastic story. So part of the efforts now are to justify that. And, and these tools I'm describing, when applied to the diagonal part matrix element, do justify that. So there's a parallel story that we talk about. Sorry, you're assuming that we just did the lambda, or can you have a last time with that? You would have a master, man. Yeah. So what I wrote here was I, I assumed that V was lambda by the fourth with no mass. In, yes. in this thing, but the, the 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 formula if you had a general V would have been to have V prime here basically, and if I had had V prime here, then the late time limit if I did make D P T equal zero and solve this equal zero, this is the solution. But if you do have a mass, and the interaction is small, then yep. the mass term would dominate that as well. Yeah, right. And I would say that for small enough fields, the Gaussian part wins. Yes, but for very, very large fields, eventually, no matter how small lambda is, the non Gaussian part remains. But can you detect very large fields? In practice, no. And so the sulfur I'm telling you is a, is a, is a, is a hypothetical. Okay. So what you can do is, is the kind of, kind of question you can ask for this matters would be if you believe that hydrogen black holes, for example, are dark matter, you have to get that from fluctuations like this. And what people do is they try and design these fluctuations that you're getting in inflation such that you're getting bigger fluctuations than you normally would get, and they're big enough that they collapse and form black holes. And now you're you're kind of interested in the tail of the five dark because you want those, even though they're rare, those are the ones that give you the black holes. And you get that dramatically wrong if you don't do this. Okay. All right. You're also assuming the, the minimal coupling between the scalars and uh, geometry, right? Yes. So you really have uh, the uh, I mean, the coupling between V and the Vichy scalar. Yeah. Okay. The, for instance, the conformal invariant uh, scalar field, right? Yeah. All those things you can do. Yeah. But yeah, you will get something different in that case, or? I think that so. Yes. I don't know how many of them have been tested. I think people have done those explored various parts of field theories. I think the statement is that if you calculate the infrared part in the field theory and you calculate the corresponding stochastic thing, if it's known, I think I don't think there's a good known. I think in all the cases that have been tested, it's true that they agree with each other. Okay, so how, why does it, why how how could this get late times right? I want to give you basically a cartoon in the argument that I think is always being used to get late time behavior right using pervasive theory, and I'm going to do it in an example you all know and love: exponential decay laws. Same thing happens here, right? If you have an exponential decay, you got some interactions, you have weak interactions, you calculate some decay rate perturbatively in that. 
you, the survival probability of a bunch of atoms, we you know, goes exponentially. But if you really only trust the perturbation theory, you would have not really believed that prediction. You would have believed this prediction. And you would have said it grows linearly in time. But if I ever got an order one factor of fraction of things decaying, then I'm not, no longer in a regime where I trust perturbation theory. So I should not really believe exponential decay laws. If you believe took seriously that uh, you can't trust perturbation theory late times. And of course, you do trust the exponential decay laws. And the reason you do is essentially the argument I'm going to use, and I think everybody's using in one way or another. Uh, and so I want to make it explicit here. So, so what you do here is you make the prediction in perturbation theory. What you actually calculate is something like this. Um, and it has a, it breaks down at a given time. So I'm calling TP is the time after T naught where perturbation theories fail. So when this factor is going to come. But you could have done that at any time. You could have done that at a, at a later time. And then you would have had a, a different domain of validity. And what you really do is you, you differentiate that prediction and you, you calculate the rate of change, the NDT. And you, you calculate this as you. And, uh, and then the, the beauty of that is that this equation, which you can derive from any one of the equations that I had before, you believe that the broader domain of validity is than the perturbative result because this equation only really relies on the decays being significantly dependent on one another. And so once you believe this is true, you can differentiate the perturbative calculation to figure out what gamma is. But then when you integrate this equation, the solution to this equation has a much broader domain of validity because it has a broader domain. So it's very much like a renormalization group argument where you remember the renormalization group, what you do is you calculate a correction that's coupling, and you get the correction that alpha is alpha squared log on some scale. You differentiate that and you get a beta function that the rate of change of alpha is alpha cubed or something. Or alpha squared, and then you integrate that again, and then you shouldn't have learned anything because you just differentiated and integrated. But the differential version of the equation had a broader domain of validity. It applied as long as alpha was small. It didn't assume that alpha times the log was small. So you can believe you can kind of get uh, conclusions to all orders in alpha log by this differential the differentiating and integrating process. And this is an example of that, but in the time domain rather than in the scale domain. So what's happening is that uh, basically it will line up at your right hand side in time independent. In that particular case, right, exactly. And and I I'm gonna kind of size that now. But before I do that, the if you kind of think what your error was, if you work to order g squared in the rate, the things you're dropping are or you're working all orders of g squared t, but you're dropping t four t. So you're there's a class of things that you're not resumming by integrating these differential equations. Now your point is right. If the, the kind of thing that would have screwed this up would have been if your differential equation made reference to where you started again, then you're back where you started. So, so the game is set, can you find a differential evolution where the evolution doesn't make reference to your turning point? Because that's something you can hope well, the, the once you found the differential version of it, the solution will have a broader demand of living. That's what everybody's doing. And so in the story I had to tell you, the game will be. And I set up an evolution equation for the differential for the density matrix, which has this property that the right hand side is not dependent on the initial So I come to you, the one I'm going to show you is going to start looking like this, so it's not going to be uh, enough. So the, so they're, they're, we're going to look for regimes in which it has this property that you you can integrate. So and that leads you to open systems. So so this is going to seem like it's a completely different direction, but really what I'm trying to tell you is that this. There's a formalism for dealing with open systems, and part of its virtue is that it leads you to these late time resumable regimes. So the open systems at face value are completely different, that you've got some system, and you get some big system, and you're only going to measure a subset of the system. You're not going to measure anything blue, you're only going to measure anything red. And then the observation is that if I only have observables that here with red part, I don't need a whole density matrix of the system. I really know this reduced estimation, so I trace over that environment. And if I knew how this is going to time, then any observable that's restricted to the red area, I could predict this time dependence until I've solved the problem of time dependence. And the way you go predict that time dependence of this is because you know that the full density matrix satisfies the leadable equation. So at some level, all you want to do is trace this equation. Doesn't sound like it's very hard. But the problem is that the right hand side of that equation doesn't just depend on the trace of row, it depends on other things. And so that the problem basically in getting an evolution equation for the reduced system is how do you make the right hand side function of the thing you're trying to find? 
And that's a problem that was solved once and for all in the late 50s. It's a linear problem. The uh, Leeuwenhoek evolution is a linear process of end matrices. Projection on the subset, uh, subset is a linear problem. So what you do is you take the projection of the subset and you ask how does it evolve? It depends on the subset that you're looking at. It also depends on how the rest of the set evolves. So you do the projection on the rest of the set and that's how it evolves. And you solve this equation, plug in the first equation to get some of just preferred to the things you're trying to solve. That's kind of the general logic. And because it's a linear problem, you can do it once and for all and never have to do it again. And so that's what uh, Nakajima and Zwanzik did back at the AC when I was born a long time ago. And so I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. Uh, you do that process, the second order perturbation. So we're going to imagine that we have an interaction telephone in between the system and the environment. And A acts in the system as a product form, but you can use it more general if you want, but it makes it simple to describe. And I take the trace of the yield equation and I solve for the environment and plug it back in. This is what you get. Okay? The linear order you get your vehicle equation averaged over the environment. So this thing is averaged in the environment. Now, this is something which just feeds the system. It's an operator in the system. The second order, you get something more complicated. You get something involving one density matrix, again, the thing we're looking for, and then two A's, the second order. And then the, the environment is all varied in this correlation function. So the the function is the other correlation to the fluctuation would be above the graph. And so all this is doing is it's showing you that uh, that in perturbation theory, your the leading piece is the mean field approximation, and then the corrections that are coming with correlations in your environment. That's essentially what's happening. And you see that this is a form that will not work for going to late times because it's explicitly involving a, that the entire history that what, how things evolve at a given time compared to how you got there in an important way. And the fact that this doesn't really solve the late time problem. Is not a bad thing because this is really a general an equation as a real equation. It's got everything in it. And so you can't solve everything all the time. And so sometimes things are harder than that. So there's not enough information here yet to get to late times. So then it's the late time question. There's a there's a limit of this equation which takes you to late times, where this correlation, this this, this convolution of the correlations is not important. So that's the effective field theory part. So the effective field theories are about exploiting hierarchies of scale. In this case, if there's a hierarchy of scales, things will simplify. And the, and the hierarchy will be if this correlation function is sharply peaked for T and for T is near S. And if the we're interested in evolutions, which are very, very slow compared to that, then in the integral, we can approximate everything except this to make point basically a constant. And we can so we take our stand around S T. And that will give us an equation that doesn't have a convolution, and which will have a chance to be the thing you can look at at the late times. Um, you should think that your intuition should be a take of thermal physics, for example. This would be a thermal correlation function that kind of typically die off when you go more than a thermal scattering in the way. So if you ask for times that are very long compared to that, then this thing I'm going to describe you will work. And because it's going to become a Markovian process rather than a, a, a full on process. And, and what I'm describing is now is, is the way you would calculate the, the um, equilibration time. If you had had a, a subset that was equilibrating in a bigger environment, that takes a long time because it's a time scale which goes to infinity if the coupling goes to zero. And the way you quantify that late time behavior is through the argument I'm giving here now. You have to check that this Taylor expansion is a good approximation, but once it is, then you can get the late time. So, so if it's true that the correlation function is peaked, and you want longer times than that, then you can expand in part of the ratio of those two type scales. And the first term in that expansion, which doesn't involve everybody dies in time at a fixed time here. So the Markovian in the sense that the rho dt only cares about rho half of t, not in the earlier times. And there's an unknown coefficient here, which is where the, the correlation function gives this, this, uh, this coefficient. And then this depends on p naught and still in trouble. But if it doesn't depend on p naught, then we're going to hope to look at this eight times along the lines of. We're having a second ago. All right. So, so the first order term is uh, not so that, that's how we'll get the late times. Now I want to focus in on decoherence, which is the, 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 the application I want to have in mind. Leading order perturbation theory, which is the new evolution, this will never decohere you. This is just one mechanics. You will never take a pure state to a mixed state, which is this kind of evolution. So the first thing that can decohere you uh, in this kind of a picture is the second order. 
The second order term, it had two interactions, two A's. If you looked at that second order term in a basis in which the interaction Hamiltonian was diagonal, then, uh, so let's call the eigenvalues alpha for this interaction uh, operator A. Then the structure of the off diagonal evolution of the density matrix has this form. It's got a thing which is quadratic. The, the order of the operators is such that it becomes alpha one minus alpha two squared with some coefficient to do with that correlation function. And so you kind of see that this kind of evolution is something which, if f is positive, is going to drive you towards, a, uh, depending on the time dependence of f, it'll drive you towards a very diagonal Gaussian in the off diagonal space. And this is what's going to happen in the example I'm going to describe. One question is, uh, to in practice, what people do when they think of these primordial fluctuations, they, they take a classical distribution in field space, not in a basis which diagonalizes A. So one question is, why should field space be the thing that diagonalizes the interaction? It turns out there's a really general argument that says that field space diagonalizes all interactions between your equation. And that's because the state you're in is a very WKB state. And remember, I argued that the momentum and the and position are, are basically commuting in the W in the leading order of WKB approximately. So it turns out that because the state during inflation outside the Hubble scale is very WKB like, it turns out that the field basis actually always does diagonalize the interaction. It doesn't matter pretty much what you write down in the Hamiltonian, it's always being diagonalized. So the very general argument is why that's the basis in which things would want to be diagonal. Now I want to get the rate with which that happens. There's a part of my story is to do with uh, things growing very quickly, and I, the, the, these slides are just justified. There's a fairly general argument as to why the factors of the scale factor go in where they go, coming from general covariance, which I'll skip over unless somebody else. And I should say that the, uh, the, the story I'm telling you is not an exotic story. If you applied this to a, a gas and where it, it interactions are proportional to the density of the particles, and you calculate the fluctuations, that correlation functions were a thermal fluctuation. The density density correlation it, it's, it's, it's given to you in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, thermal compressibility. And if you use that in these expressions, it gives you all the standard things that you know about scattering the thermal mass, but in a very efficient way. So that just underlines that this is a technology, theoretical technology that's been tested a lot in, in non gravitational settings. So now let me just close out with the application to cosmology. So I want to take the vanilla, vanilla, vanilla models that people actually compare to when they say that this picture of where the fluctuation works. So, so what is that model? It's just basically general relativity coupled to some single scalar field. And the single scalar field is there because you'd like to have the universe be very, very, very uh, like the center space in inflating. Uh, but you don't want it to always be the center space because you want to inflate again at some point. And so the scalar field is, is the thing that's giving you the evolution away from the zero space. So there's some homogeneous solution to the equation of motion for this, in which the you have an FRW metric with a scale factor in function of time, and you have a homogeneous uh, background scalar field. And the Friedman equation tells you the Hubble scale is related to the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the scalar field. And the whole name of the game is you're, you're arranging this potential such that potential energy is dominating so that you're not moving very fast because phi dot squared is small. And then if this would basically be a constant, then h is a constant and then you're in the state where you want to be. So there's a, one of the small parameters I'm going to use is quantifying how good an approximation that was. And that's the slow roll parameter, which is measuring the time dependence of h compared to the Hubble's time itself. And in terms of potential, that involves a derivative of potential. So in these models, you're always looking for potential that are very flat. And this is why. So one of the expansions I'll do will be expanding the power of the slow roll parameters. But for the fluctuations, you want to go beyond the background. You want to look at the fluctuations. And so now we have a delta phi. We have a metric which is uh, no longer just the background metric. It has uh, gravitational wave fluctuations and then also uh, fluctuations that are rotation scalars of various types. And there's, uh, yeah, this is a very well developed field in cosmology. This whole picture is a semi classical expansion. So, the other small parameter that justifies why these corrections are small compared to background corrections is that this ratio has to be small. And that's why I will always be expanding at power to base for the red line. So, that's uh, the second expansion parameter. Third one will be this being outside the Hubble scale. The, the wave number will satisfy that k is much less than a h. 
Now, it's a famous thing about that, because you're not a cosmologist, you might not know this, but it's a famous thing in cosmology that it looks like you've got a lot of scalar field to. You've got zeta, you've got psi, and you've got delta phi. It turns out that all but one of those things, they're all kind of, there's only one independent degree of freedom there, because all the other ones are related by you know, gauge transfers. So because uh, one of your notions of time, the scalar field is telling you uh, one of your notions of time. And so you could choose a gauge where time is defined by surfaces where phi is constant, in which case this is zero. So you can set that to zero by a order transformation. Another thing you can do is you can ask for the uh, spatial slices to be flat, and that corresponds to the to be constant, or zero effectively. And so I'm going to jump, I'm going to at various times use different variables, uh, and they're all equivalent, just different gauge choices. And the two variables you'll see are v and zeta. Zeta is this zeta. And so uh, these are just two choices of the gauge, and they have different, they're convenient for different things. Zeta has the property that in late times outside the horizon, it's, it becomes time independent. It's not a like long wavelengths. And V has the property that it's like a canonical field. So that its collation functions don't depend on slow world parameters. So if you're trying to count the slow world parameters, it's more convenient to use. And I'll sometimes show you the answers in, in each of those variables. All right. Um, so now I need to give you a system and an environment. So our system will be this. These guys you look at, that's the system. Then all the longer, shorter wavelength and longer wavelength modes are the environment, but the shorter ones are the ones pretty high. So I'm going to focus on those. And so uh, here's an example of a short wavelength mode that we're, we don't measure in the sky. Um, we're going to do a trace over all these guys and we're going to restrict our calculations in this region. But here I can use the slow roll parameters so that the calculations happening. Uh, so epsilon is small, everywhere h over m blank is small, and here I can use, I can expand the power of k over a h. Those are the three things that are being. And I work the leading order in all those things. And then the, what I do is I just take the interactions that general you said that these modes have, I take the field, and I take the long wavelength part, and I take the short wavelength part, and I split them up, and then I separate the system and environment, and I ask what's the Hamiltonian that connects them. And if you think general relativity, there's a lot of interactions. And the pattern is that they, they involve two, everything except for the potential term involves two derivatives and three or more fluctuation fields. They could be scalars or they could be metric. And each time you have a fluctuation, the order of Planck comes with it. So if you're interested in counting the power of the age of Grand Planck, the leading one will be this something involving a cubic interaction, which has one over n Planck. But I showed you in general that in the, as far as the coherence is concerned, you have to work in second order in the interactions to see the coherence. So the very smallest contribution will have to go like one gram Planck squared, as you thought the answer actually does. So I can get that two ways. I can, I, can get, I can work in second order in this interaction, or I can work in first order in this interaction. But again, first order doesn't decohere you. First order does things. It gives you non Gaussian energy, but it doesn't decohere you. So it's going to be sufficient for leading order to work in second order in the cubic interactions. And happily enough, those have been all written down. And so, so each of the fluctuations in the metric. The metric and the scalar. I'm just kind of generically telling them. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what they look like, and specifically, if I separate the scalar from the tensor. So here I'm showing you an example of a scalar, scalar, scalar fluctuation where I'm using data as a field. So there's three betas here. These are all the background quantities. Uh, epsilon is the slow roll parameter. Here's one involving a scalar and two tensors. And then here's one involving a tensor and two scalars. And there's also a tensor, tensor, tensor ones. And there's more than one interaction of each type. But every one that I have not written is suppressed compared to this one by either a slow roll parameter, so it involves more slow roll parameters than this one does, or it involves the spatial derivative being replaced by time derivative, which is a suppressed when you're in a super hollow scale. Um, so the claim I'm going to make is that these specific interactions are actually these dominant ones uh, when you're expanding all those three small quantities. You don't need to consider the tensor tensor tensor. You, you, in principle, you do if you're gonna if you're interested in in how tensor modes get decohered. No one's seen a tensor mode yet, so so what I'm gonna do for free is I'm gonna tell you how the short wavelength scalar modes decohere the tensor ones because it's actually an easy change to the one I want to do anyway. But we didn't do the tensor 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 one, but you, there's no reason why you couldn't use these tools. So now you let's take the scalar 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 one to start with it. Then you, you you take this thing and write it in the system plus environment. You expand it all out, so there's going to be system cube terms of the environment cube terms of the environment system squared and so on. Now you just check which ones are the ones that can possibly 
be relevant. And so you can throw these away. They don't connect the system to the environment, so they will not hear you. They will give you things like non-housy energy, but that's it. You can resist this one because uh, this involves two systems in an environment. But momentum conservation says that the momentum in this thing have to add up to make a triangle, which is correct momentum conservation. And you can't make a triangle with two short sides and a long one. So you can't have two systems in an environment. You have to have at least sorry, two, two environments. You have to have at least uh, it's not the time. It's not the time. It's not the time. Okay. 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 Yeah. I mean, I'm just going down. Yeah. You'll see that, that uh, because of the stuff we've talked about already, this will be very quick to tell you what happens. So the only thing that's allowed by my mention kind of that, that one that I crossed off there is forbidden by you can't make a triangle with those kinds of sides. You have to have two long sides and a short one in order to have an uh, interesting thing. And that one is, is, is killed off because I have a derivative acting on the system as opposed to the environment. And the system by assumption is a longer wavelength than the environment. So that's press is the one where I differentiate the environment. The environment. So I'm basically left with this one where I make both these guys environment and this guy a system. So I'm, I'm always getting things that are linear in the system. And that's nice because that means that I'm effectively still a Gaussian problem. I can have, I can take a specific wave number and I track what it does. I don't have to actually Worry about uh, the wave numbers uh, scattering where I, where I excite, uh, you know, I evolve out of the, the, the single mode state for the purposes of describing equivalence. All right, so you can now you can kind of see a lot of the answer here because if I write this in terms of a canonical variable V, you can kind of see the coefficient has got a larger square root of epsilon and a larger and blank. And so you're not surprised when I tell you that the answer is quadratic and this is going to be linear and epsilon and it goes like one and blank squared. And then what I had to do is calculate the correlation function of this thing, which is the hard part. And that's uh, that's what happens most of the time. But I can tell you the answer. So, so you're led to a Markovian, these are called Lindblad equations, these are Mark the, where you, we, we check that the Taylor expansion argument works. So you actually ask for the subdominant term. Uh, if, I, if I compare the peak, peakedness of the correlation function with the evolution uh, on, the, on the Hubble scale, what happens is that the that it is peaked, and so that the corrections of this equation are suppressed by uh, by powers of k over a h. So it's a uh, this is a, a, a leading approximation to the evolution of the, the full evolution of these models. That's the first thing. These things are these correlation functions that are integrated that appear in general. Now let's say we're going to both of them. What I've written here is uh, these these are the second order correlation function terms. This is actually a first order term where I've, I've written a first order term because I'm, there's going to be a divergence in here we're going to have normalized in the in the uh, error Hamiltonian, so I have to keep keep track of corrections to the Hamiltonian that are smaller than what I thought. So here's the divergence. So this thing, if you calculate it in dimensional regularization, it has a this is a this is not the whole answer for the magic part, it's a piece of it, but it has a factor which goes like one over n minus four in the dimensional regularization. And the important thing about it is that uh, that appears only in the term in the evolution that has the zero over Hamiltonian in it. And it has the uh, structure as a function of momentum and time, which is eight is time. This is a is a structure which is consistent with the Divergence being absorbable into the kind of terms you know are there, the ones in the Einstein action and the curvature squared kind of terms, which are necessary at, uh, at one loop of gravity. So, the reason you, you could have k to the fourth here, you got two k's over there and two k's here, is that the fourth derivative kind of term that you have for gravity at one loop. Go ahead. Sorry, I was wondering your effective on the is a nominal mission because usually the big volume. It tries to run a mission on Newtonian. It's an open, open quantum system. There is a, a real part of the Newtonian and then the imaginary part. It seems to me that it's the, you have all the, your effects on Newtonian here are real, right? They are in this case. It's really, all, I, all I really need this, this kind of funny is the counter terms. Right. And the counter terms, it, it, it's not, none of that dissipation stuff that appears in the counter terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. All the all the dissipation back in these functions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on this one in the end, but it's uh, that's where all the uh, the open system physics is. So my, mostly I'm just showing you the imaginary part just to say that the vertices are there. You might have thought I'm gonna sum over small wavelengths. I should see the vertices. I do, but they are exactly the form they have to have to be normalized in the standard way. So just vanilla quantum field theory. But they do look like 
normalization of the higher derivative terms. The curvature squared terms, yeah. So it's so the logic is that I'm power counting this like an effective field theory. And that's why I said I'm expanding an H over M blank, is because that's the thing that controls the loop expansion. And so I'm being systematic in that expansion. And if I work to the order I'm working, that's the only divergence that will appear in that term. And I, I'd only have to worry about the higher terms if I went to higher order in H over M blank. All right, so that's that. So now here's the answer now. It's all the thing that will be to hear you is it turns out it all comes from this term. And that you be fine. And that's because of the Physics that the hearing is happening at, uh, above Hubble field. It's not really a short distance physics. And so it did come to an, an infrared finite way, or ultraviolet finite way. And here's the answer for the real part. It's got the factors that you know how to be there, the epsilon, the nation over in Planck squares. It turns out there's a k squared there. Um, then it has a, a function of k eta. k eta, eta is the conformal time, and that's k eta is just code for k over ah, which was the ratio of the wavelength to the Hubble scale. And I'm giving this to you in a series, the leading order in power of k eta. At late times, eta goes to zero. If eta, eta is a time that runs from minus infinity to zero, so it's zero at late times. And so the super Hubble region is when k eta is, is much less than is between minus one and zero. I, I'm still going to open with normalization if you're doing that. Yeah. Because you were now going to introduce how you're doing it back to begin with. Yep. So you would need an additional three parameters. No, because these are squares. Yes, that's, that's all true. This but, is, are, are you are you renormalizing it to be zero? I'm doing it as I'm doing it. What you do, you could do, you could, you could, we could have this conversation without gravity. If I just take a, a massive field and a, and a massless field, like a, a Mexican hat field, let's say, yes. and I integrate out the heavy guy and I get the effective period of the light guy, that also has higher derivative interactions. And so the same issue is the issue you're worried about is that if I have higher derivative interaction, then I need more integration constants and because I've got more solutions, some most of which are runaways. But the statement and the effective field theory is that the uh, it's not true that the all of this, the, the in effective field theory, the, those higher derivative interactions are perturbative because they're down by you're expanding an energy is divided by something. And so the assertion in the effective field theory is that the solutions of the effective theory agree with the solutions of the full theory order by order in the small thing. And those extra runaway solutions, they're all exponential in the small thing. So they, they're not, they're not a, a series in the small, small energy. Your, your divergence is entering into your perturbative expression yep. here. So, and it's going like um, h squared, presumably k squared. Yep. So it is entering here. Yeah, but it's so perturbative. You can't ignore the first term there. You, you, you would have risen from that parameter. I'm, what I'm doing is completely vanilla. So it's uh, I'm doing exactly what you would have done if you had done the scalar field case. And you asked, what if I integrate out a heavy field, how do I track the same issue in the light fields? Yes. And that, there you know the whole answer because you know the full theory. And so you know that there's no sickness in the theory because the full theory wasn't sick. And then you see, then you see explicitly that the, uh, that the, uh, the, the correct calculation with the effective theory, where you work to some fixed order in the small expansion parameter, forces you to, not, you, you don't trust the, 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 the solutions that are growing, the new solutions that are to do with higher derivatives. Those are all six solutions, and so you're so the the within the domain of the effective theory, they're never there. But well, I still think that I have a free parameter in the even the non even the terms that are not growing because. No. Oh, oh, I see. You're worried about the coefficient of the curve. I'm worried about the coefficient of the curve. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. that you do, and so so that, that again is exactly like in scalar field theory. So what happens there is that the, if you so you have one more. In, in principle, you have one more normalization thing. You've got Planck scale as a as a as yeah, a parameter. Yeah, you would lose the parameter. Right. Which you didn't include in the original. Right, because of, and the reason you don't is the same. If you were doing chiral perturbation theory, for example, the same thing happens that you have, you have higher derivative interactions with each comes with a new coupling, and so now it depends on what you calculate. If you calculate something which sees polynomials of momenta, then you need to know you need one more measurement to figure out what that parameter parameter is. But if you calculate something like a logarithm of momenta. That doesn't depend on those parameters. So you can some things you can calculate without having to do know them, and some you can't. And this is one of the ones you can without knowing them because it's that ultraviolet finite. Okay. And sorry, I think it's really a question. What's up to was that saying the last equation? It's like from here it looks like one plus two. Yes, yeah, that correct way of saying graph. Yeah. So 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 the, the two things you get to this one is that there's a piece here, which is the leading piece, because it's the highest power of one over k eta. And then there's a sub boundary that I'm not totally dependent on the media. So it depends on exactly where I split the system from the environment. Like that's what K star is. It depends on exactly what the initial time was where I said the things the environment and the system were uncorrelated. All those details are in the sub dominant term. But this leading piece at late times is universal. It doesn't care about any details at all. 
And this is the one is I've normalized the set that the one is the contribution of short wavelength scalar modes to the equilibrium long wavelength scalar modes. And the two is short wavelength tensor modes to equilibrium the long wavelength scalar modes. So if I, you know, when I showed you in the previous slide that I had a scalar theta theta scalar tensor tensor, if I do the scalar theta theta one, I get this with one. And if I do the scalar tensor tensor, I get it two. It turns out it's the factor two. It's a, it's just a thin space with all your counting. And there's a similar story if I did the uh, tensor scalar theta one. If I ask, I'll show you the answer for what happens if you if you ask how the scalar is equal to the tensors, at least that part of it. I, I, will, I can't give you the tensor 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 one. So uh, the main thing is that's the that's the, the the business end of the calculation. So when I calculate the decoherence and I give you answers that don't depend on details, it's because this is the thing that's dominating in the answer. Right. So now let, I'm going to just finish off with what's the decoherence parameter. So it's a for decoherence, the density matrix squared is is, is equal to the density matrix if it's given only in the pure state. And because the uh, the eigenvalues and density matrix are probabilities, the trace of this being one is the same statement as the uh, if, if a trace of row squared is one, if and only if row squared is row, if and only if the state is pure. So this is not one, then it's mixed. And the thing I'm going to give you is delta because it's a Gaussian integral we're going to do. And so, as usual for Gaussian integrals, you get the a thing in your exponent which comes down as a determinant. So I'm putting you the this. Kind of a combination because I was doing a no scenario at the end, but the formula I'm going to give you is what the formula for delta is. And, and the lesson is that if delta is zero, if and only if the state is zero. And here's, I take, I take that part that, that in the real part of that that I have there, stick it into this, and this is the answer. And I get it, and these numerical factors are coming from that term I showed you, the reading term. And here's the one plus two that kind of works with the other part. And so this is the thing I showed you before. And so you get yeah, all the factors you're going to have an intuition for. This is the leading order in eight times. This is the leading order in the, the loop expansion, the leading non trivial order. And there's this total of pressure. Now, if you do the same thing for tensors, the same counting goes through. And the only the main difference is that the you don't have the slow roll suppression. So I guess the, the slides here, I'll see that in a second. So the three things you can't miss are. This is something which is uh, small, and you know it's small because this combination, a squared over epsilon m times squared, that's the amplitude of the fluctuation of people measuring. And know that's 10 to minus 5 squared. So this is 10 to minus 10. And so I pulled an epsilon out, uh, multiplied and divided by epsilon. And so an epsilon can't be bigger than 10 to minus 2 because the, the amplitude of, of tensor waves compared to scalar waves is controlled by epsilon, and we haven't seen tensor waves. So, you know, this is smaller than 10 to minus 4. So, this is less than 10 to minus 14. And that's my statement at the very beginning. That, that's an upper bound of how big this would be. And then the other factors tell you that it's growing. So, the fact that it's going like A cubed is, a, is it growing like gangbusters. And of course, the fact that it's going like 1 over K cubed says that it's a lot of the shortest wavelength of the longest wavelength uh, deeply reverse. And for tensor, it's the same story. The main difference is that there's no epsilon because. And the difference is, if you look at the Hamiltonian, the tend to tend to tend to interaction, they don't have, they're not spread by total well, Otherwise, it's exactly the same. And we did the scalar contribution just to make sure that, that there's no funny business going on and that really the power kind of gets it right. So now let me just summarize. So the immediate question is what do you hear is quantum fluctuations? You have, the story is that there's a quantum fluctuation in the early universe, seems to explain well. The primary fluctuations we see in the sky now. Um, one thing here is how did you get from classical to quantum to classical? Answer that we don't really know. But I'm giving you evidence that you don't, I'm, I'm giving you evidence that there's probably a floor. The, the, the more interactions, the more, more environments you interact with, and the stronger those interactions are, the faster you will decohere. And I've given you the bare minimum. I just took only the modes that had to be there for this model. Only the interactions that had to be there in general activity, and they're already decohering like crazy during inflation. And so it's probably true that the decoherence is faster than what I'm telling you, but I'm already telling you something which is very fast. That's what uh, you. So this is bad news for uh, if you're looking for quantum evidence for the, this, this picture of quantum fluctuations. 
It doesn't mean it's impossible because the thing is that there's things that are assumed that I'm doing a calculation of one skater field. That's behind this mode zeta, the gravitational skater mode likes to freeze as by the drive, and that's not true. We have more than one skater field. So, so the, the real lesson here is not that it's impossible to find a quantum effect, it's, it's that you want to know how the quantum effects depend on the parameters of your problem so you can see where they're big. And so this is the first step in that direction. And then the last ones are the bigger picture is, you know, in that expression I showed you for delta, you might have thought I only trust that the delta is small. But I'm actually arguing that you can trust that formula when delta is over one because I'm resumming late times because I've used an equation, an evolution equation, which has the character that it can be integrated and have a broader domain of validity than the perturbative calculation did. And that's an important thing too, because uh, we're interested in late times and practice in cosmology and in black hole physics. And so the fact that there exist tools that have been well tested that are aimed at giving us late time evolution and a perturbative, you know, resumming perturbative information to late times is super useful and we should be crazy not to use it. It's just not in the standard training for relativists and particle physicists. And so that's the bigger message that these tools are, are there. There are books written on it. And so you can go to chapters which are non Markovian. It's in lots and lots and lots and lots of technology there that uh, we're crazy not to be using. And they almost certainly will be relevant for things like the uh, information loss problem for black holes, for late time behavior and cosmology. And anytime you want to quantify your errors, when you're making uh, quantitative predictions at late time and local gravity. So thank you for your time. Questions? Did, did you say the multi field inflation in the coherence of the technology? I don't know. I almost saw that calculation. But one of the important so, so part of the story I have was that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the top of scale was doing this and the modes were doing this. And I was doing the calculations at the AP. And I didn't do the calculation here. And, and normally, for the if you weren't doing the coherence, people normally are not worried about this because zeta freezes. And so once you're here, nothing really happens until you get to here. And so there's no issue of propagating it through the future if you have only one scalar field. But even for the background fluctuations, if you have more than one scalar field, then you can have interesting evolution happening here. And so a completely open question is what happens if you're to the decoherence here? And even here, I mean, the, the, we were using the it was important in all the things I was doing that, that I could throw away time derivatives, for example, because I showed you there's only one interaction. And it might be true that if you kept those time derivatives, it might not be the bad thing, but nobody really knows. So it's like one of those things that's up for grabs. And so if you were to try and evade what I'm telling you, that's one of the first places to look, is that there are a lot of things that I'm using are not true in public school models. So if I remember correctly, uh, not a good moment, uh, the power spectrum of CD is nearly a scale environment. Yeah. So you are assuming you know, always uh, uh, this feature, right? Uh, I didn't I didn't need to submit it, it was just kind of but it was in there because it's uh, it's a true of the uh, leading fluctuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you want to go beyond, let's say that you want to test uh, some theory of gravity beyond Iceman Hilbert, eventually you it, it could be a way you know, by measuring the correlation to extract the effective theory for gravity eventually. Uh, so is there a way for me to use the fluctuation to reconstruct the, 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 the eventually a new theory of gravity that should be uh you know beyond Einstein Hilbert? I mean this inflation is uh, something that uh is scale variant also, right? It's, yeah. Uh, and some people I remember some people propose uh, many different uh, models for inflation, right? Right. So the Starobinsky and the R square or uh, the multi-scalar field or um, you know, string like cosmology. Yeah. So is there any you know uh, way to you know to to say that by measuring this thing we can understand uh, who is the real uh, fundamental theory of gravity? If there is something beyond the uh, Einstein theory, or is there any way you know to use uh, I mean this, this the measurement of fluctuation to figure out really what it, if there is something beyond Einstein or uh, it, 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 yeah, I, I'd say yes and no, and since that in principle, yes, I think that uh, you know the the calculus I described would actually capture sort of many of the models you talked about because the, all the single field models like oh, the yeah. the, the density, that's really just some choice of potential in front of my work. And so, uh, and as long as you've made it a slow roll, one thing that you, that you could do in a single field model that uh, you know I was throwing away 
higher slow roll parameters compared to the lower slow roll parameters. So the, the you know the eta, if you if you the sec second derivative of that Hubble scale, I, I was neglecting compared to the first derivative. And some models that's not true. So there's something you could do there. But it's also true that that you're although in principle you can in practice you only have a handle on a very small number of things. Unless people find uh, uh, measurable uh, non-Gaussianity in the early universe, because once you have non-Gaussianity, the problem with the power spectrum is that basically in the scale invariant case, there's nothing to measure because the scale invariant tells you what it is. And then what, what people are really looking at is the deviation from scale invariance, and that's a bit model dependent. And then you already learned something from that because it's been measured not to be scale invariant. But once you have non-Gaussianity, the scale invariant limit has an arbitrary function for the information in it. So, so if you can see that and start measuring that function, then you start learning a lot about what's going on. Because even the scale invariant part starts to carry, carry a lot of information. But until that happens, it's we're kind of uh, there's not a lot of information. Right. Uh, my understanding is that the, the, the quantum, these quantum observations in the early universe evolve into the classical basic observations that we get right yeah. now. Right. Is is that is there any laboratory system where you can see a quantum fluctuation becoming a classical fluctuation in an observable classical field? Yes. There, there, and so there, you know, the, you can particularly the qubit people do it a lot, but it's not just the qubits. There's a there's a whole literature where uh, you can take qubits and then couple it to a bath, let's say, and you kind of then do the measurement where you you take a small quantum system, a two level system, and, and watch it evolve. And there's a there's a lore that there, you know in a two two level system that, that you get three things in your density matrix because it's a you know, two by two matrix, and there's a time scale associated with the the and if you're thermal then you there's only one number so that means that two of them went away, and and the two ones are are the off diagonal ones and then there's also the ratio of the diagonal ones and there's a lore that the probably it's a theorem if people you know I'm not in the area but it, but that that the the diagonal ones off diagonal ones go away faster than the diagonal ones go to thermal limit and that's something which has been tested you know that's been seen and the calculations show it and it's uh, so there's a lot of, of a lot of specific kinds of systems where you can watch this evolve and, and this is I mean basically I'm taking their formalism and applying it here so it's a what you know one and a really instructive thing to do which we did first was you can take qubits in all the gravity situations, like they, they take an accelerating qubit and take a qubit in a sitter space and take a qubit, you know, outside a black hole and ask all these questions there because you can be super explicit because now you've just got a two by two system and all, this whole Nakajima's Wanzig thing becomes very, very concrete. And you can watch the third. And, and, and so if you think about the Unruh detector, the classic calculations of the Unruh detector, that what they're actually telling you is not the late time behavior, they're telling you the rate with which you leave the ground state. For your unruh detector, but if you did ask the late time behavior, their calculation would have broken down because of the breaking down of perturbation theory. But this formalism gives you the thermalization rate, and and they if you look the late time they do thermalize with the appropriate temperature in all those examples, the Hawking temperature or the Sitter temperature or the acceleration unruh temperature, but you can you can quantify exactly how fast. And in that case, what happens is that it, the time scale goes like one over the coupling squared to the field that you are coupled to. And so that's exactly where you need to resum things because your your g squared t is one essentially. Yeah. It's a very good talk, but I couldn't follow the calculation very well for me five minutes. Um, but um, I forgot I lost track of the the non-minimal conflict of the influence on to uh, the Vichy state. There was one. So this this was a spinel. Einstein, a minimal couple scalar field, uh, and then simply some couple to the tangent. Okay, so if you put in the non-minimal couple, would that have a positive effect on the equilibrium score? Yes. In principle, so what if, if it's a single field problem, what I would do is I just go to the Einstein frame and then I take that non-minimal thing, put it in the potential, and then it becomes a special case of potential. So as long as you've not ruined inflation, all it's going to, in a way, that's going to affect what it is, is that it's going to affect the slow roll parameters to get a change in potential. So as long as you're you have a hierarchy in the slow roll parameters, then my calculation would apply to that. Yeah. But if you if you break that hierarchy where you say eta is larger than epsilon or something like that, which is not you know crazy, so I don't know how to do that, then you, you, you can redo the calculation, but we would put our calculation would apply directly. Um, but I think what would happen there is that you, you so instead of getting uh, eta epsilon, you get eta. And so you just gonna change the details, but it won't change the overall size. In the sense that the big thing I'm still gonna is the a squared over line squared. Yeah. And that'll still be there. Well, yeah, you change epsilon for eta, but 
would you still be neglecting the same As long as you're, so as long as you're using those three expansion parameters, which basically everybody is the, the, the long wavelength of the approximation, the slow roll approximation, and then the semi class approximation, mm -hmm. then it's going to fall into this category. But the details will change if it's one of these models where the IRP is a slow roll parameter. Mm -hmm. And then if you have not been more coupling than more than one skater, then all that's are off again because it's such a good idea. I think what I'm trying to get out of this is that, uh, so in the Higgs inflation case, uh, now you are talking about really large, right? Yes. I, right. Yeah, I want to see how does the Higgs inflation compile. Yeah, in that case, what happens is that the uh, Higgs inflation is a special case of an exponential potential, right? Where it's V naught uh, minus, you know, V1, V the minus lambda phi or something like that, right? And what happens is that the, uh, this, 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 uh, if you write that as being say one minus you know little v one, uh, this the thing you're thinking about is with c r is something like that right? It's big c in here, so this v naught in the Einstein frame is going to be one over c or something like that. So so the, that's the paradox of that that in in this way of writing it, it looks like you're doing something very radical by making c large. But in the Einstein frame, you're just making the potential small, which is actually a nice safe place to be. So that in that sense, it would just fall right into the, it, this. Is just you copy the slow parameters for this, and then apply my answer, and it'll be able to find. Mm -hmm. Although this is a dangerous one in the sense that uh, these are my these exponential potentials are the best model that I can find because they, they agree with the data really well. But they also predict that uh, the slow roll is happening because phi is large. You don't have to you don't have to dial any numbers that are small in. It's just you, know, you just have to be in large field values and make it make it uh, slow roll. But that means that. That epsilon, which is like v prime over v squared, and beta, which is the second slow roll parameter, which is like v prime prime over v, because it's an exponential, uh, you're finding that epsilon is basically eta squared, because this is one like the exponential squared, this is the exponential. And so, so here you're kind of designing in that epsilon is small compared to eta. And so that's the thing that's suspicious in my calculation that for these models. To see any of these effects, do you need to see non gauss quantities in C and D? Sorry? To see any of these effects, do you need to see non gauss quantities in C and D? You mean know, the, 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 the deep coherence effects? You know, you need more than that, Bob, because the, because the non gauss quantity, you're really looking at correlation functions. Uh, you know, you're looking at more than two fields, you're looking at three fields at different times or something. But as long as you have three fields all at the same time, you have this problem that you're you're only sensitive to the diagonal parts of the, the density matrix because because uh, you, there's no canonical momentum in here. If you, if you had this at a time and this at a different time, so you had to actually see the momentum, that's the kind of thing that would see the off-diagonal part of the density matrix. But most of the just the if you're just looking at the non-Gaussianity and you're looking at basically very late times, so everybody's at the same time, and you're looking at powers of the fields, then you're insensitive to all this stuff, and that's part of the challenge that people have had. Even before we came along, people knew it was going to be hard to find quantum effects because they knew that they were fighting the fact you needed to see the canonical momentum in here. And the canonical momentum, when you're outside the Hubble scale, falls like one over A to some power. And so you're fighting the fact that that's actually a very small piece of the field because things are freezing. That's kind of, that's, so the time dependence is kind of going away. Yeah. Your calculations apply to slow representation models. Yeah, yeah, Explic and we've explicitly been using the slow roll approximation. Out of the slow roll implication, the problem is which ones would have the smallest big coherence? Uh, well, if you're in the category where the second slow roll parameter is smaller than the first one, yeah. in those ones, it would be uh, everybody who has the same value of, of H and the same value of epsilon would be the same. And then the ones that have the, the decoherence is smaller, the smaller you make epsilon. So as you drive down the scale of inflation, yeah. which is what you're doing when you make epsilon small, then um, you're making decoherence less and less important. Yeah. And so one way to ask the question is you could ask, so how low does the scale have to be to have a observable quantum effect now? Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be something like 10 to the, if, you're, if, you're, if your potential was at the scale of 10 to the 9 GDB or something, so not a crazy scale, yeah. you, could, you could have, uh, if you, if you go that low, it's also true that you don't need 60 equal rings, you only need like 40 equal rings. So if you're down there, then it could be true that you then this that you haven't been here. Yeah. So it's that, that's why it's useful to know how things depend on the parameters. So yeah. and then that's why I'm not selling it that you'll never see this. <laughs> so yeah. You have to go to the very different corners, but you now you know which part is important. And then we usually temperature that then 
Well, it does in the sense that, it, that, that the recapture is telling you how, how many holes you need to take. And so but that's it's only entering through that. Mm -hmm. In, to, to go back to what you just said about the um, correlations between like the country of Mensa, you know, and I and yeah, the second derivative there. So, you know, practically speaking, if you were going to try and measure something like I, now and then you just have to import the, the quantum parts of the, of the up diagonal parts of the density matrix. You want the expectation value of like the field configuration now and then field configuration like really far in the future. Or right, or you do, and now you even do momentum position, momentum field correlation functions at the same time. You did that, and everyone else is. So, yeah, and then to do that, practically people would have to measure the, the, the change in the next yeah. right. Okay, yeah. right. and that's that's why you said something like it poses one over a or something like it's during inflation, it, it drops like a rock, yeah. And so, so okay. you know, the thing is not hopeless to see the time events, right? Because if you look at the power spectrum, you know, not just in the same B, you know, against A, look at B of A, it goes something like this, right? Is it a log, log scale? Or this, you know, this, this is the epoch of, uh, these are the modes that cross the horizon that radiation matter quality. And these are the ones that came in during matter domination. These are the ones that came in during radiation domination. And, 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 and this goes like K, and this k to the ns minus one or something like that, but it's good, or sorry, k to the ns. So ns is basically 0.96 something, but it's going like k. And this goes like k to the minus three. And this, this suppression by one over k to the fourth is understood because uh, when the modes cross the horizon during radiation domination, they can't grow because you have to, in order for a mode to grow, you have to be in the matter dominated universe. And so the ones that can come in during radiation domination are stunted. And so they're stunted by one over k to the fourth factor. So the thing is that you, because you can, you know, there's measurements, the CMB sees this, and then, you know, the alignment alpha four sees this, you really have a measurement of a lot of Ks. And so you, you're kind of seeing the primary fluctuations. Here, you're kind of seeing the primordial part of it. And so you're seeing it over a window. You're seeing it a function of K is like seeing it a function of time in some level, because you have different Ks are crossing the horizon at different time. So there's, you, know, you have access to time dependence, but it's, you know, of course, it's grainy access, but it's not happening. So you know, there are people who have thought, have thought a lot about how you can set that up, and I don't know what the best proposal is right now. Yeah, I think we've done uh, more of the same on still question. Good question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah, the basic conclusion is that we almost know that there is no evidence of anything escaping the audience. Right. You're, it's not, it's not an example that will make a model where it happens. If, but it's true that uh, you take the vanilla models that people are using, those ones seem like they would be very deep here. And so, as modulus, this, the, this, this question mark of getting from the end of inflation to the rise and reentry, we haven't calculated that. And I'm, I'm just making the assertion that if you're already classical here, you won't become quantum, but that might be wrong. Thanks very much again. Thank you. And there's a couple behind you.